This morning we're turning to Psalm 13. If you have your Bibles, if you please turn there with me. Psalm 13, we'll be reading the entire psalm. Hear now the word of the Lord. To the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. The word of the Lord. Let us pray together. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming to worship you, to hear your word preached to us, to be ministered by your Holy Spirit. We ask now that you would warm our hearts by your presence and form our minds by your truth and soften our wills to do your bidding. Transform us by the wonder of your grace and send us out with your peace, joy, and encouragement. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. I'm taking time out of our series on Daniel to speak to a pressing issue. If you weren't here last week, if you're not on the list for our newsletter or perhaps you're visiting today, I told the congregation that I would be dealing with a difficult subject this morning. Less than two weeks ago, our brother Robert, who was loved by this congregation, sadly took his own life. This was a shock to all of us. Robert was open with some of his struggles, but nothing approaching this degree of desperation. In a note to the church this week, I mentioned that for those of you who wrestle with depression or at one time or another have had harmful thoughts, you know, thoughts of self-harm, this subject can be unsettling and even triggering in some cases, resurfacing dark thoughts from the past. So again, I want you to know that you're not alone that if you want to talk, there are plenty of people that will talk to you, myself and the session included. We are here for you. I also want to remind you that it's important to bring these things out into the open with people that you can trust rather than suffer in silence. No one wants that. God doesn't want that for you. Some in this room have been impacted deeply in their lives because of a suicide of a loved one. And I realize that can leave emotional scars that never fully heal in this life. So I hope and pray by God's spirit that I will handle this subject with sensitivity and honesty this morning as it deserves. May happens to be the mental Health Awareness Month. I do not gear my preaching to designated topics and causes assigned to months of the year. However, I do find it's an opportune time to raise awareness in our church about mental health. There are Christians who struggle with clinical depression, either for a brief season or an extended period. Some have mental health issues that require medication. Others have unwelcome thoughts of self-harm and some have even attempted suicide and God has graciously intervened. While our culture over the years has become more open and created an environment where we can speak freely about these issues, that has not always been the case in the church. For some, it's still taboo. 
There are believers who are embarrassed or ashamed by the way they feel. They view themselves as spiritual failures because Christians aren't supposed to feel this way. But the Bible does not support that assumption, as we'll see in our passage today. I am grateful for some prominent Christian leaders who have come forward to share their experiences, one of whom is Dr. Philip Riken. Some of you may know that name. Dr. Riken is the president of Wheaton College. He served under James Boyce at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, one of the flagship uh, churches in the PCA. After Dr. Boyce passed away from liver cancer, uh, Dr. Riken was appointed as senior minister and had a fruitful ministry. He is a prolific author and really a leader in Reformed evangelical circles. In his book, When Trouble Comes, published in 2016, he explains he went through a season of deep discouragement. His troubles were extensive, and this was unprecedented for him at the time. He had problems sleeping, and he even thought of taking his life. And he writes, one day I said to myself, you know, I understand why people kill themselves. This is how they feel. It seems like the only way out. Now that wasn't a thought that he wanted to have, but it was part of this intense personal and spiritual battle that he was wrestling with. So if there are any here this morning or those listening online who assume that these struggles do not affect faithful Christians who know their Bibles, I offer Dr. Riken's testimony as an example to the contrary. Now, a word to parents this morning. Some of what I have said thus far and some of what I intend to say is going to go over the heads of your young children. Others are going to pick up on words and ask you questions. And I think that provides an opportunity for you to talk about our brokenness in this world and God's benevolence in the gospel. It may surprise you to hear this. It was a surprise to me. But the second leading cause of death in America for ages between 10 and 34 is suicide. Ages 10. To 34. We're not always aware of what our children are exposed to, what they're feeling, or what may prompt such despair. So this morning we're looking at a psalm of lament. Psalms of lament are songs that reflect a state of disorientation. There are occasions when the writer feels tremendously perplexed, utterly forsaken, paralyzed, overwhelmed, or lost in despair, and cries out, Oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or as it's written here, how long will you hide your face from me? A lament expresses sorrow, grief, and distress, but almost always ends on a note of hope. So after the psalmist rehearses the trouble he's experiencing and cries out to God for deliverance, he concludes with an expectation of future grace, which is very encouraging. But often the waiting is long and hard. So as Christians, how do we deal with these issues? How does God want us to handle our inner turmoil and suffering? Well, I think we find an answer in this psalm as David openly struggles with his misery, looks to God in faith, and hopes in the Lord's deliverance. So there's three things that I want us to take away from the, this passage this morning. I want us to see the depths of despair, the cry of the soul, and the confidence in God's goodness. So first, notice the depths of despair in verses 1 and 2. David says, how long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? So this question, how long, is stated four times, underscoring the intensity of David's distress 
It also expresses his despair because he does not know how long he must endure. He cannot answer the question, how long? It seems like forever. This is a person in anguish, but he's honest with his feelings in the midst of the struggle. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate about the book of Psalms. The Psalms invite us to be emotionally authentic. The beautiful thing about the Psalms is that they give us freedom to be real. These ancient songs teach us to live with integrity with what's going on on a heart level. And then we think of the Lord Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when we think of him there, we learn that from Jesus it is, it is a godly faith can struggle, that a godly faith can feel depths of sorrow. Now the issue here in Psalm 13 is that David feels abandoned. Lord, will you forget me forever? Lord, you know what I'm going through, but you're not acting. You're not intervening. How long must I wait? Have you ever felt like that? Now, of course, God had not abandoned David, nor will he ever abandon you as his child, but there are times it feels like God is hiding his face. That terminology in scripture is associated with alienation. You think of, of the ironic benediction, when God's face shines upon us, it signifies blessing. But here, it appears that God is looking away. David feels alone, and his suffering in his loneliness only aggravates his condition. Where are the blessings of God that he has promised? His peace, his protection, his provision. God has made many promises to us, but it is unbiblical and unrealistic to expect the Lord to protect you from every harm or to make you always feel at peace as if you, you have not a care in the world. There are degrees of peace and perfection in this life with, which only find their perfect fulfillment in heaven. In the psalm, there is no confession of sin, there is no recognition of guilt that keeps God's blessing away from David. We may go through tough times, even terrible times, for reasons unknown to us. From our perspective, they don't have any purpose whatsoever, at least one that's not apparent to us. We can be so consumed with the present, with the moment, that we fail to see the bigger picture. We focus on a snapshot of our life when God sees all from the beginning to the end. And he has a plan for you. And in his love, he is not content to leave you where you are. And so what does he do to promote growth? He weans you from ordinary pleasures by allowing you to go through dry times and inner darkness. What has been known as the dark night of the soul. To purify you and to move you on to greater heights. If you come to me with a trial that is just sucking the life out of you and you ask, Pastor, why is God allowing all this? I cannot give you a complete answer because I am not God. But I can tell you with all confidence that the Lord can use this to make you a more godly person than you are today. And perhaps you can't see that now, or you do not want to see it. All you want is relief. And believe me, I understand. But in the end, you will come out of this with increased spiritual maturity, greater empathy, and a deeper intimacy with Christ. That might not take away the pain that you're enduring at the moment, but it does lessen the sting. And it reminds us that in the providence of God, there's no such thing as meaningless suffering. Perhaps the hardest part is in the waiting. Notice verse 2 here in the ESV. It says, how long must I take counsel in my soul? Now that's a bit obscure. The language here points to a turmoil of thought. So the NIV, I think, states it better. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? 
David wrestled with his thoughts and every day had sorrow in his heart. The heart represents your inner life, the core of your being. So David says that in the depth of his heart, there is nothing but sorrow. And it's ongoing. It's not just one day, it's every day. And you add to this his restless thoughts, and that's a pretty good description of depression. Now, when people say, I'm depressed, what they often mean is, I'm sad. There are days when we feel low, and our, 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 our mood is low, we feel down. But depression is something else. It is much more serious and incapacitating. Depression is characterized by a dejected mood over a period of time. And the mind becomes dull and it's hard to concentrate. Usually it's accompanied by troubles with sleeping and uh, the person feels numb. They, they lose hope. They're robbed of energy and the motivation even to live. Of course, as Christians, suicide is never an option, but it only goes to show how desperate someone can become. And evidently, this is what happened to our brother Robert. A detective gave me a letter that he wrote to me, addressed to me in the church, and I would like to read a portion of it to you. He says to all of us, thank you all so much for the love and support you have showered upon me over the past couple years. There haven't been many blessings in my life lately, but all of you have been a true blessing to me in many ways. Life has been very difficult for me. As some of you know, I am a mess and I have had enough. And then he says, maybe there's mental illness or even brain damage from a head trauma he suffered as a child or even abuse. So in Robert's case, he ultimately lost all hope that his anguish and sorrow would cease. And he made a, a desperate decision. As I mentioned, I don't think Robert was in his right mind. Such acts do not of themselves forfeit grace because we have all done dumb things in a moment of weakness. The problem with suicide is you can't take it back. It's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So let me just be clear as we talk about this that suicide is a violation of the Sixth Commandment. Do not murder. Both murder and self-murder are forbidden. And suicide leaves uh, behind a wake of misery. Now, I don't excuse it at all, but I realize that deep depression can be torturous. Not only is the heart overwhelmed with a heaviness, so much so that it feels like the person is breaking inside. The mind is, is full of despairing thoughts. It's like a constant uh, stream of thought that does not stop. Hopeless thoughts, dark thoughts, so that it, it becomes unbearable and the person would do anything to make it go away. And often those dealing with depression feel trapped in their suffering since it's a condition that where relief does not come quickly, even if you take medication, takes time to kick in. And so this can be mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually exhausting. One described their inescapable struggle this way, fighting but not wanting to fight, wanting to stop but finding no peace in stopping, wanting to run but impossible to flee, no place to go. This is the worst part of it all, no place to go. Those who have never experienced that degree of depression simply don't understand it. And so they say things like, just get a hold of yourself. Just snap out of it. But the person is unable. And so we do a great disservice to people when we offer simplistic answers and assume that their problems are tied to a lack of spiritual commitment. Now, I'm going to say a word about John MacArthur. I, 
I think all of us admire Dr. MacArthur. He has been faithful to the scriptures for decades. He, his personal integrity is not in question. But I think I need to say some things because of what he mentioned recently in an interview. He said there's no such thing as PTSD. There's no such thing as OCD. Uh, it's P uh, PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, is just a failure uh, to, to know how to grieve. Now, my uncle served in Vietnam. He would not talk about it because it was too distressing for him. After he came back and was newly married, my aunt went to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and when she came back, she stepped on something that made a sound. My uncle jumped out of the bed, you know, right out of his sleep, pinned her to the ground, and would have done serious harm to her if it were not for her screams that kind of awoke him out of a daze. Was that because he didn't know how to grieve well? People with OCD have intrusive thoughts that just circle through their mind over and over again. It is torturous. Can they will that away? Can they pray that away? On another occasion, Dr. MacArthur said, my belief in God's sovereignty precludes me from dealing with depression. Now, I suppose if you believe that God was not in control, you would be very anxious and depressed. But how about those who affirm God's sovereignty? Faith in God's sovereignty does not prevent depression any more than a belief in God's sovereignty prevents cancer. It's God's sovereignty that allows these struggles into your life, and it's God's sovereignty that gives you hope that he can use them for good. Now, Dr. Kissler is a good friend of Dr. MacArthur. And Dr. Kissler has told me that Dr. MacArthur believes that in some cases medication is necessary. Unfortunately, he didn't mention those that in his comments, and so I, I thought it was necessary because we all respect him to make that clear. There are degrees of depression. Some experience for a matter of weeks and then it dissipates. Other forms require medication. Now, in our society, we're quick to prescribe pills. We, we want easy fixes to cover over our problems, and I recognize that that practice can be abused but sometimes medication is necessary. What most people don't realize is that clinical depression is physiological. There may be psychological factors, spiritual factors, but not always. People can experience an imbalance in brain chemistry, which thankfully can be treated. There are some Christians who are suspicious about this and feel like that's just a cop-out. You have the Lord, just persevere in prayer. To such people, I ask, if you have a broken arm, don't you go to the doctor to get a cast? Is that unspiritual? Naturally, you pray for healing, but you take advantage of the means that God has provided. Some people say, well, in centuries past, people didn't have medication for a depression. Absolutely right, and it was awful. What happened in centuries past when someone's appendix ruptured? They died. Now that can be avoided. The Bible is the standard for godly living, but biblical times are not the standard for our quality of living. I hope you can see the difference. God in his common grace has provided remedies and treatments in our age that can benefit us. And that does not diminish our faith in God. It's an occasion to offer thanks to God for his goodness. Maybe you've dealt with depression in the past or perhaps you're dealing with it right now. It's been a long road and the end is not in sight Others suffer from fractured relationships, chronic illness, or the loss of a loved one. I know it's hard, but you're not alone. 
David and countless other saints have endured similar things. And following the psalmist, the encouragement here is to be honest with yourself. Honest with others. Honest with God. Realizing that it's okay to struggle. And that struggle should lead to supplication. Lament is pointless unless it culminates in prayer. So we move now from the depths of despair to the cry of the soul. In verses 3 and 4. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. In the Christian life, we have to learn to make a difference between accepting the things that we cannot change and asking God for change. Appreciating God's sovereignty does not mean passive resignation to every circumstance. It's because the Lord is in control of all things that that should prompt you to pray. And your inner life can help to direct your prayers. David is depressed. It seems like God has hidden his face. And so he cries out, look on me. Answer. He feels trapped in darkness. And so he prays, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My assumption is if, that if you are struggling or something's troubling you, that you are crying out to God for deliverance. This is what the Lord would have you do so that when he answers, he receives praise not only from you, but from all people around you who, where you can testify to his goodness and his grace. Now, again, relief is often delayed. And so you have to ask God for patience and the ability to endure. I've said this before. If God doesn't change your circumstances, he can always change you. Believe that. Now David has another concern, his enemies. Now perhaps you don't know anyone who has a grievance against you. Praise God for that. But you do have enemies. There are demonic forces that love to attack you when you're down, to undermine your trust in God. And then there's the unbelieving world. And part of the reason that we cry out and ask God for deliverance is to show the unbelieving world that our God is with us, that he is faithful to his people, that he will uphold us. If you know that someone you love is deeply depressed. I trust that you're praying for them. That's the most important thing that you can do. There might be times they don't even know how to pray. I've talked to people who are depressed. They, they can't even process what they're reading in the Bible. They're just so stuck. But we're also assured the Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. But there are additional things that you can do if you think someone is on the verge of harming themselves. Talking to a family member or a friend about his or her suicidal thoughts and feelings can be extremely difficult for anyone. But if you're unsure whether someone is suicidal, the best thing to do is to ask. You can't make a person suicidal by showing that you care. In fact, such a person, you know, giving them that opportunity to express their feelings will provide relief from their loneliness and pent up negative feelings. It may even prevent a suicide attempt. So how do you start a conversation? Something simple. Recently I've noticed some differences in you and I, I wondered how you're doing. Or, I, I want to check in with you because you haven't seen yourself lately. And if they express a sense of hopelessness or if they have thoughts of self-harm, you just ask simple questions. When did you start feeling this way? Was there something that, that happened that made you start feeling this way? Have you thought about getting hope? Or getting help? What, what can I do for you right now? At this stage, you just want to listen. You're, you're not lecturing, you're listening. But you can also reassure them in ways that are helpful. You tell them, 
you are not alone in this. I am here for you. I might not be able to perfectly understand how you feel, but I care about you and I want to help. If a friend or family member tells you that he or she is thinking about death or suicide, it's important that you evaluate the immediate danger the person is in. Some people have suicidal ideations, just thoughts, but they say, I, I don't intend to act on it, but I don't know where these thoughts are coming from. I wish they would just go away. There are those, though, who are at high risk for committing suicide when they have a specific plan, they have the means of carrying it out, and they have an intention to do so. So if, if a suicide attempt seems to be imminent, you call 911. You get that person to the emergency room. Until they get the help that they need, do not under any circumstance leave a suicidal person alone. Again, the key is prayer. You can offer support, but you can't make a suicidal person well. God has to act. And that person has to be willing to get treatment. So we cry out for ourselves in our despair, but we also cry out for those we love who may be in a vulnerable place. David cries out to the Lord, but he does so with a confident hope, which may be a bit surprising. So we consider the depths of despair, the cry of the soul, and lastly, the confidence in God's goodness in verses four, uh, five and six. But I have trusted in your steadfast love my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Other translations say he has been good to me. So this psalm begins in a state of disorientation but ends in a state of reorientation. Even in the midst of David's suffering. There is no reason to think he is voicing his praise after relief has come. He is affirming these things in his pain. David is able to look to the future in hope because of God's faithfulness to him in the past. You have dealt, past tense, with me bountifully. So if God helped you before, surely he can do it again. That is a simple principle that we're apt to forget when the waves are crashing over us. You stop and you look back, you see that all that God has done for you, he's brought you through hard times before, you're still here. The Lord not only sustained you, but taught you important lessons along the way. By remembering God's gracious acts in the past, this um, renews and strengthens your confidence in his goodness and creates hope for the future. No matter how dark the depression or how painful the disease or how heartbreaking the divorce, how deep the grief, you cry out to God trusting in his steadfast love. Now even mature Christians can begin to question the extent of God's love and protracted trials. When we're hurting deeply, we tend to measure or test the extent of God's love. Lord, if you really love me, you wouldn't allow this to be happening. Lord, if you really loved me, you would have brought relief already, but it hasn't come. There are times when you believe in the promises of God, but you also wonder if they are true for you in a particular circumstance. And if that's where you find yourself this morning, or if that's where you find someone that you're ministering to, turn to the gospel. Turn to the gospel. It is there that I see the goodness and glory of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When I go to the gospel, I realize that God doesn't have to prove his love for me in my current situation, even if I am desperate. Jesus has already proven his love for me on the cross. Thoughts may pass through your mind that God is withholding something from you, but the gospel tells you that Jesus gave all of himself to you to meet your greatest need. 
Our feelings can deceive us. Facts don't. What does the Bible say? Here's a trustworthy saying, worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. That is a fact. And if he loved me that much, I must trust him. In all my struggles, when my suffering seemed unbearable, I'm not going to rehearse all that, and relief seemed to be out of sight, I, I, I learned a, a sobering but very liberating truth, and I may have shared this before, but it's this. I worship a God I don't understand, and it's okay. I don't have to understand. I just need to trust him. Peace does not come to us because the questions of our mind are completely satisfied or the circumstances of our life are completely serene, but rather because we trust in a heavenly Father who lovingly reigns over all the details of our lives in Christ and knows exactly what he's doing. If you feel like you're spiraling down, you go back to the cross and you see your Savior they're literally loving you to death. You may be going through a dreadful time right now or something challenging may be on the horizon. On the basis of God's word, I can tell you the Lord is going to use it for good and his grace will be sufficient. God is no less God when affliction comes. He knows what he's doing even if it doesn't make sense to you. The storm will eventually pass. I've been there. You may not believe it now, but the way you're feeling will change. You might be in the thick of it, and you see no end in sight, but God does. There's a wall in front of you. You can't see the future. God is above it. He sees all of it. You may feel deserted by the Lord, but he has promised never to forsake you. You cannot be abandoned by him if Jesus was abandoned for you. You have a high priest who sympathizes with your weakness, and the truth is he has gone far beyond the darkest despair you've ever experienced. His heart is full of love and compassion towards you, and just as Jesus' life moved from lament to praise, our lives do as well. We're all on a pilgrimage to our heavenly home. We have a taste of the restoration of all things, and one day it will be complete. Jesus has already sung the song of lament on your behalf so that you can sing songs of praise to him. So if you are struggling, please be honest. Learn to pour out your heart to God. Ask him for his deliverance that he might be glorified in it. And you sanctified in the, in the process. The answer may not come quickly. But this is what you need to know. The Lord loves you. And you can be confident in his goodness. The intensity of what you're feeling, and you tell this to your friends, will subside. And as you look back on the way the Lord has led you, you will have a song to sing. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we cry out to you this morning as your people bringing forth our questions, our confusion, our sorrow. We don't always understand why you allow your people to suffer to the extent that they do. But knowing who you are and who you have revealed yourself to be in the Lord Jesus, we declare our trust in you. Even in our pain, we affirm it is well with our souls because of the gospel. In Christ's name, amen.